very excited to read Horse and His Boy. I really hope it holds up. You might potentially see me crying on this podcast next time. If it's not good, I'll cry. But I think it's going to be good. I'm very excited. Hello. Welcome to Reread. This is going to be an interesting episode, to say the least. This is the podcast where I cry. Yes, given recent events with the protests and everything and the nature of this book, I I guess just to warn people, we are going to be talking a lot about racism in this book. We will probably be touching on current events. If that's something that is going to be too upsetting for you, just a heads up. But we did think that it would be a good idea, given the nature of this book, to offer some recommendations of books that actually deal with race and power in a nuanced and ultimately positive way. So... Morgan, if you want to take that away. Okay, so I will also, we'll type up this list and put it in the show notes. And I will also provide additional books that I haven't personally read, but I've heard are really great. Just so that you have even more variety, because I have a whole bunch of books that like I know have great reputations for talking about these sort of topics that I haven't read yet. So I do want to include those just can't personally recommend, but have heard great things. But so the books I'm recommending... I mostly try to look for books that either are like specifically talking about race or are set in like sort of alternate fantasy settings that are reminiscent of like a particular region and do a better job than this. So starting off, there is a great series that handles Native American folklore with a Native American main character by a own voices author. That's Trail of Lightning is the first book by Rebecca Roanhorse. Um, forget the actual name of the series itself, but it's urban fantasy. It's like set in like a futuristic world where like the, I believe, Navajo gods like reemerge. It's really fascinating I uh, highly recommend. For Middle Eastern, which I especially wanted to talk about, given that that is the society that is being, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. I would say caricatured. Caricatured, yes. Thank you. That is correct in The Horse and His Boy. Uh, the first book in the series, I believe it's a trilogy, the third book isn't out yet, is City of Brass by S.A. Chakraborty. I loved it. It's a really rich, detailed exploration unfortunately i don't believe it is own voices but the writer is really went to school for and i believe still does a lot with um middle eastern history so it does come from like a very well researched place in terms of what i can tell and i've heard other good things from people that would have more knowledge than i do i also cannot recommend enough anything by nk jemison that's uh, gonna be she has actually one series that i haven't read that is called the Dreamblood duology, I believe, that is set in a uh, Egyptian-esque setting. But the books I've read by her are the Broken Earth t- trilogy, which the first book is the fifth season. Which you bought for me. I did buy for you, I and still, it's great. Still have not read, but I promise <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I'll get around to it. And the Inheritance trilogy, which starts with Hundred Thousand Kingdoms. But the fifth season, especially when talking about power does just uh, an excellent job and to some extent getting into race as part of that but it just anything by N.K. Jemison I cannot recommend enough she handles everything beautifully then for like a more Asian like Eastern Asian inspired setting the Tensore series by J.Y. Yang. Um, the first book is The Black Tides of Heaven. They're actually novellas, so they're really like short and nice, but like the world is really interesting. There's also a lot of great non-binary representation in them, which, you know, is a totally different thing, but I thought I would mention in case anyone's interested. Then for like Central American, um, and it's also like a historical fantasy sort of setting, uh, Gods of Jade and Shadow by Silvia Morena Garcia. Really great. <laughs> I don't, I'm trying not to go too in depth. And then 
sort of Indian inspired setting is Empire of Sand by Tasha Suri. And then I also have, I have completely avoided, I believe, in any of this, any white male authors. Uh But I think that if you want to talk about race and power and you're okay with reading a book by a white male author, I think he does a great job. City of Stairs by Robert Jackson Bennett is an excellent story that talks about is basically uh, there was an empire that took over basically the entire world. It's kind of vaguely reminiscent of the British Empire. And then a country that is vaguely reminiscent of India ends up overthrowing them and like killing their gods. It's a very interesting examination of the political relations between these two countries after that and sort of the lingering damage of imperialism and colonialism and how power structures have changed. And I really, really enjoyed it and can't recommend enough. And then just quickly, I also wanted to say specifically, if you're looking for portal fantasy and you want more diverse portal fantasy, the Wayward Children series by Shauna McGuire has a lot of both diversity, I believe, in race and in sexuality of characters. And then the 10,000 Doors of January by Alex Iharo is a portal fantasy that the main character is um, mixed race and that is a huge part of the story. So that's my list. Could you explain to me what is a portal fantasy to this noob here? Yes. So basically exactly what Chronicles of Narnia is, I suppose this book itself is not getting to that portal fantasy, but the idea that you go from our world into another world, that's portal fantasy. So Alice in Wonderland is like the basically ancestor book. Peter Pan actually, too, is very similar. I'm going to Neverland, that's portal fantasy. I'm trying to think of other great examples. But yeah, Narnia is another classic portal fantasy series. All very fine recommendations, I'm sure. On my end, I would, the first one I would recommend is Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. I, I'm not a fan of the idea of the great American novel, but if there is one, it would be that book. It follows the unnamed protagonist who is African American through different parts of America and, and sort of living the African American experience through these different parts of America. So he goes to the South, then he goes up to New York and he travels everywhere in between. And it's a very fascinating look at identity and how race is imposed depending on all sorts of factors. On that same note, I would also recommend Swing Time by Zadie Smith. Really anything by her is great, but Swing Time in particular is one of my favorites. It's a similar idea where the protagonist goes around. She is also unnamed, and she goes around to different parts of the world and has this lifelong identity crisis born out of her family, her friends, her upbringing, where she lives who she interacts with, and it's super, super fascinating. Another book I would recommend, really anything by Louise Erdrich. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing that. She is a Native American writer. Tracks is one of my favorite books ever, and it really gets into issues of Native American identity, Native American struggles, and it's super fascinating. Can't recommend it enough. And then also... Given that C.S. Lewis has a line in here disparaging calorimine poetry and saying that it's all I'm just going to recommend in general that you read Rumi. And yeah, I think those are those are all my recommendations. So. (laughs) So now I guess we have to talk about the horse and his boy. Yes. And I know, as as you referenced a lot last time. (laughs) You have a very personal connection to this book, so I just want to give you the space to navigate that here, if you would like. Thank you, Casey. Yes. (laughs) This was, when I was a kid, my favorite of the Chronicles of Narnia. And I I just want to acknowledge up front that, like, you know what? I come from a place of privilege where I was able to overlook certain things in this book because, like... I'm white and I I come from that place of privilege. So just putting that up front. But 
there were a lot of things that I really loved about this book. And I think I was able to, you know, even when I was a kid first reading this, I did understand that some of the things in here were outdated ideas. And I will say that, like, you know, when I was reading these with my dad, he would he would tell me, you know, this is this was a book from a long time ago. And that's why some of the ideas here are not not good ideas that we should be continuing to think about today. They're outdated. So, like, I did know that, but I was, you know, in a place of privilege where I could put those things aside and enjoy the things I really enjoyed about the book. And I think that part of those things is one of, it's one of the more, like, tightly plotted Chronicles of Narnia book. There's a very sort of clear plot going forward. I really enjoyed the main characters and their dynamic, and I'm sure we'll talk more about some of those things going forward. But when I did return to it, this time, I, I knew I was going to have more of a problem with it because I did remember some of the racist elements. And I, I understood that I would have more problem with it, with it this time. But I really, truly did not remember the extent to which that pervades every single aspect of this story. And so I think that coming into this, one of the questions that I have, because I, I took two like front and back pages of notes while I was reading this like only 200 page book. So like I took a lot of notes, but there is really a transition in my notes where I stopped commenting on some of the aspects and started just taking like pure nostalgia notes because I needed, I was feeling so, (laughs) so sad about my lost experience of this book that I was like, I need to just, you know, take these nostalgia notes. So I have something to keep reading it for. Yeah. So, um, I, I have been like really struggling with the question of like, I, there are things in this book that I now understand that like, there are things I still enjoy in media now. And do I enjoy them because I first read them in this book? Was it that foundational for me? And so how can I reconcile my enjoyment of some of these elements with then the racism that builds up the structure of the entire story? How can I deal with that? So I, Hopefully I won't actually cry out the podcast. Yeah. I don't think that's actually going to happen. But that's why when I made the joke about crying, it's because I am feeling very conflicted about still having a lot of nostalgia and fondness for this book when truly, like, I, it's not a case where you can remove the racist elements and the story could like, remain intact. You know what I mean? It's not like there's just, like, lines in there that you could take out and you could be like, now you can enjoy the story. The entire premise is built upon racist ideology. So that's that's what I'm struggling with and, and part of what I'm sure we'll address. But I think for you, like you didn't remember the story at all, right? So you have no fondness. And I think you just fully could not enjoy anything because it's racist, right? Yes. I <laughs> Obviously, you had prepared me to knowing that that would be a big element of this book nevertheless i was shocked by just how blatant the depictions of of the people who are clearly drawn from middle eastern stereotypes and i texted you like when i started reading this book i texted you (laughs) i am on page three and this book is already a disaster this book is just brimming with racist ideology. And that was something I struggled with was trying to think, and this is actually something I do want to talk about. Is it possible to make this story without it being racist? And I, that's something I was trying to figure out because I don't want to go in just basically doing a bunch of virtue signaling and saying like, oh, this book is super racist. I'm not racist. Mm-hmm. I think that we can do more than that, and, and especially nowadays. I know this podcast, I mean, this podcast is probably going to come out a few weeks after everything that is happening right now with um, across the U.S. in response to the police brutality that's taken place in Minneapolis and Louisville. But I, I do want to do more with this book than just say that it's racist. Because it is racist. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think that there there is opportunities to really break down in what ways it's racist and how it boils in prejudices and biases into even even the most mundane details. 
the implicit biases that take place throughout the comparisons between the Calormines, which, unfortunate name, by the way, and the Narnians, where there's this constant contrast being made by C.S. Lewis, where anything that involves the Calormine culture is bad, and anything involving the Narnian culture is good. To the point that where one king over in the Calormine world is fat, and that's used as a pejorative, but when they describe the Archenland king as fat, he is described as a jovial fat king. So even even body weight isn't treated the same across these two different cultures. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of things that we can take away from this book that we can turn into a positive of recognizing how microaggressions operate in literature, especially when you're talking about a culture that clearly, in this case, C.S. Lewis had no personal experience with Middle Eastern culture. He's obviously drawing it from whether it's stories or third, fourth, fifth hand accounts. He is pulling from resources that that do not illustrate the Middle Eastern cultures in an accurate or positive light. And yeah, that's something I have to yeah. grapple with. This, this, I mean, th- you know, just to be clear, I think this book is despicable. And I am honestly kind of horrified that it is still being read to children just on the basis that it is a book in the Chronicle of Narnia series. And I, I'm... I apologize, Morgan. I know how much this book means to you, but I do just need to say, like, it is insidious in the way it instills its ideology into the narrative. Because there's no way you can come out of this book thinking anything other than that the Calormines are, are awful human beings. They are cruel. They are greedy, vain, backwards thinking, second class humans and given that they are described as being brown they're described as wearing turbans they're described in ways that are clearly evoking middle eastern imagery it's dangerous and i and i do want to get into that because i think i know that some people who will be listening to this podcast will be saying hey this book was written 60 some years ago it's who who cares it's a racist book written in the 1950s what else were you expecting and i think that that's something that we need to be more critical about because whether we like it or not this book is informing the way people think about different cultures and different people yeah so i think (laughs) <laughs> Maybe here's a good point to set up just kind of a few establishing things before we get further in. So I did do a little research. I will say there was not as much written about this book as I thought I would find. One thing I did find out, I was pretty sure this was the case, but I have confirmed it. So C.S. Lewis read the English translation of A Thousand and One Arabian Nights and really liked it. Like, really liked it. And this is very clearly, a lot of scholars have said this, it's pretty much accepted. This is his send-up of, like, A Thousand and One Arabian Nights. That's his inspiration. I suspect, I did not fully look into this, I suspect that's probably his only real exposure with Middle Eastern culture. And, well, A Thousand and One Arabian Nights is great and a classic. Uh, You should probably uh, be looking at a little bit more if you're gonna be referencing a culture that strongly. And obviously he had his own very racist take on those things. Then I also was interested. So I looked into sort of what is, what are, what does everyone think about this book now? Just the common lay people, you know? So, you know, I I went and there's a bustle article about like, hey, I reread this book. It's really racist. But the other sort of prevailing thing I found, and I I did a lot of like looking on Tumblr for this because that's where I go to like (laughs) see what people think now, I guess. There is a very strong little subsection of the Chronicles of Narnia community that this is their favorite book, partially because it is sort of an outlier to the rest and because it is more tightly plotted. Um, And so there's been apparently a big push for a long time for specifically this book to get made into a movie. And there's a lot of still desire for that. 
it was weird how I was on Tumblr, which normally like uh, people kind of associate with a super liberal feminist, blah, blah, blah. There was like weirdly not a lot of discussion of the racism of this book on Tumblr. Um, maybe I just didn't see it. It didn't pop up in like the most popular posts that are tagged a horse and his boy. But I thought that was really interesting and it was something I did want to discuss. And I think it leans into the whole discussion about how much you can separate this story from its racist, I don't even want to say elements. I feel like it's more pervasive than that. Because like, if I know that like some streaming service, I think Netflix has like bought Chronicles of Narnia and they are planning to make, they're planning to adapt all of the books. How, how do you do that with this book? Is that possible do you can you have do you need to just fundamentally alter what the book is right so I think that is something we can really discuss and get into and then I also kind of wanted to talk I wish I had more language to really talk about this with and maybe you would know terminology more but obviously there's different kinds of racism and so like I was thinking when I was reading this of a another book I read that was a British children's authors like send up of a thousand one Arabian nights. That's from, I believe that book is from the seventies or eighties. So slightly more recent, but I remembered that book and I was thinking like that book is what I thought this book is where it's like t- definitely racist. Cause it's just using a lot of stereotypes, but it, it's the sort of racism where it's like, uh, I, <laughs> I wish I had a term for this, but it, it's more like, a racism of ignorance where they like read a thousand one Arabian nights and really liked it and therefore wanted to do a story inspired on it. And there's not this idea uh, seeped in that book that the culture is like just bad intrinsically and that these people are just bad intrinsically. And it's still racist. Again, I don't recommend that anyone read that book. It's still putting forth like harmful stereotypes, but it, it seemed to be coming out of ignorance. And that's what I thought I remembered The Horse and His Boy being. I thought I remembered it being like an ignorant work. And it certainly has that to it, but it also feels deliberately malicious, especially be- because of the ex- comparisons between the white characters and the non-white characters. And just like you said, the constant comparisons between the two, it, it really makes it difficult <laughs> yes to, <laughs> to talk about this book yes <laughs> i think the term you might be looking for is ethnocentrism which is the idea of boiled down evaluating other cultures based on your own culture standards and usually evaluating other cultures negatively based on your own cultural standards or norms or mores or whatever the case might be yeah this book is chock full of that that to to give an illustration of like one of the many 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 forms this takes in this book anytime the calormines are talking about they refer to them as barbarians the narnians despite calling them barbarians they always feel it necessary to include that they are also beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> should we should we at this point just do a really super quick summary? That way people who haven't read this book, um, and if you haven't read it, just just don't. Yes. Or if you haven't read it in a while, just a quick summary to <laughs> update people. Yeah, let's let's do that. Okay. So essentially this is set in the period of time in Narnia where the Pevensies are ruling Narnia. But this is pretty much the entire book is set in Colormine, which is like the the Middle East of this book. And just to illustrate the the name color men, it's it literally looks like color men, like colored men. So I don't know if that was intentional, but it's got to be right. You don't. That's not a coincidence. This is a deliberately racist name. I'm just gonna start a segment right here called. <laughs> you c.s lewis and that'll be the first edition so thank you c.s lewis <laughs> yeah so okay our main character is shasta and he is a little we are explicitly told white boy who is living in color mean he was he has been raised by a color mean man who we're told within the very first pages is not his father even though shasta has believed this is his father 
the his supposed father decides to sell him. So uh, Shasta runs into a talking horse named Bree, and they run away together. They're trying to head for Narnia in the north, where people are free, um, because slavery is a thing in Colorine. They run into another a girl with her talking horse who are also heading to Narnia. Um, this is Arvis is the girl. She is a Colormine noble who is trying to escape an arranged marriage and her talking horse, Twin. They try and head north to Narnia. They have some misadventures getting there, including running into King Edmund and Queen Susan and the prince. Um, oh God, why am I forgetting the prince's name? Ah! Prince Corin. Corin, yes, thank you. Who just so happens to coincidentally look exactly like Shasta. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yes, Shasta is mistaken for Corin, and that's how he finds out that the Colormine prince wants to marry Queen Susan, and now he's tried to like trap the Narnians in their capital city to like force her to marry him. So then. Shasta and Arvis discover that, like, one, the Narnians have managed to flee, and two, there is now this plot by the prince to secretly invade Archenland and Narnia, steal Queen Susan back, and forcibly marry her. So they journey across the desert in this very daring mad dash for Archenland to try and warn people of Archenland and Narnia that this invasion force is coming. They manage to do so. The Colormine forces are thwarted. And it is revealed that Shasta is actually Prince Kor of Archenland, Corin's twin brother who was born like a minute before him or something. So he's now crown prince. So he is restored to his family. And Arvis is also allowed to stay. And flash forward to the future, they get married and end up ruling Archenland and everything is happily ever after. And I do, I do want to note, like, so Aslan has probably the least amount of screen time i'll say in this book and he more operates in the background there's this sort of ongoing trope that a lion will suddenly appear and will chase them and kind of subtly move events towards this one outcome although aslan can't help but have his i am god speech at the end we'll get to that (laughs) but i do want to say that my cover of this book is the most delightfully dumb cover (laughs) I've ever seen on a book. There's Shasta and the horse, and they're looking up into the night sky, and there's just Aslan's face superimposed on the night sky. It is the jankiest looking cover, and I love it so much. And it does not happen in the book. Like, this is a scene that the artist was just like, ah, yes. Oh, Aslan yeah. It's, it just, it, there's nothing like this in the book. So I don't know what this is. And then also, like, even even the drawing of the horse, it, everything about this is so shoddy. The, the trees look like lollipops. I don't even know <laughs> what's going, like, this, whoever drew this was high while, <laughs> while they were drawing it. So. Yeah, well, your set is from the 70s, so yes. I feel like, that, yeah. Yeah, so I, I did try to find information on who drew this, but I unfortunately could not. But if anyone knows anything about this cover, please let me know. <laughs> I need to know more. We'll also put, hopefully, uh, cover photos yes. somewhere where people can see them. Yeah, my cover is a lot more boring, but I, I do like it, but I like all these covers. Um, It is basically the entrance to Tashban, the capital city. So a lot more boring, but I feel like all your covers are just (laughs) true gems. They they are all amazing, so I'm happy about that. Before we get into everything, I do want to point out a line in this book that... And I'm not sure I'm gonna, if I'm going to have to censor myself, because this is an actual quote from the book. So, it's at the point where Arvis has met up with uh, Lassa Raline, I believe her name is. I'm just going to call her Lass. And Arvis is trying to scheme with her to basically, how am I going to get out of here? And Lass is like, why would you want to do that? You can just stay here and marry this guy that you're supposed to marry, who is now the Grand Vizier 
to the he's called the Tisrock, which is basically the king of the Calarme nation. So the Grand Vizier is super rich now, you know, and she says, But darling, only think, three palaces, and one of them that beautiful one down on the lake at Ilkeen. Positively ropes of pearls, I'm told. Baths of Actis <laughs> milk. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and I just wanted to have have it on the record. C.S. Lewis literally wrote the words baths of this <laughs> milk <laughs> yep <laughs> there are some bangers in this book in terms of just like lines i'm like all right <laughs> go in clive there are many lines that have not aged well for a variety of reasons yeah that is one of my favorites anyway yes thank you for letting us have some levity before we delve in. So the thing to say is that very early on, it is established that the Calarines are slave owners, essentially. And in the way that it is described and just the way Shasta's presumptive father at the beginning of the book, we are told that he is miserly, that he beats Shasta when he's not having a good day. And uh, he quotes bad poetry. Apparently that's a thing in Calarmine or Calarmen. And then we're introduced to this other character who is writing, as we later find out, Bree, the talking horse. And he, like, wants to buy Shasta as a slave. And the way... The way we find out that Shasta essentially is white is thus. The person who wants to buy... Shasta says, This boy is manifestly no son of yours, for your cheek is as dark as mine, but the boy is fair and white, like the accursed but beautiful barbarians who inhabit the remote north. End quote. And that kind of thinking is basically prevalent through the entire book. That's what I actually found shocking. I thought that at some point it would kind of let up and it'd just be like, an unfortunate moment here there like i was thinking that it would be kind of like a breakfast at tiffany situation which mm. if any of you have not seen that movie it's it is legitimately a great movie that has the misfortune of mickey rooney playing an asian character let's go lazy this time i'm warning you I am definitely this time going to call in the police. It is as bad as it sounds. Anyway, so I thought we were going to have that kind of situation where it would be like this nice, cute little story about a talking horse, which, yes, that is very cute. That is very cute premise. That would be, unfortunately, upset every now and then by these racist moments. That is not the case. The racism is baked into the entire story. In fact, the whole premise of the story only works on the assumption that the Calarmine culture is bad, so we should run away to Narnia, where it is good. It's not just characters running away from bad situations. Like, if Shasta was just running away from an abusive adopted father, and Arvis was just running away from, like, a bad, again, a bad home life situation then we might still be like, oh, it's unfortunate that he chose to have like the people of color in these sort of situations. But it's no, this is this is part of the culture. Arranged marriages are part of the culture. Slavery is part of the culture. And those things are bad. And therefore, the only thing to do is escape all the way to Narnia where these things don't happen. And yeah, the other thrust of the plot, um, the invasion only happens <laughs> because there is the uh, very, this has like a lot of mm -hmm. <laughs> centuries of centuries of racism, but that the, you know, non-white man so desires a white woman that he will do anything to have her. And there's very thinly veiled allusions to rape, forced marriage, those sorts of things. And that is the entire thrust of the invasion plot. It is not just that they want to conquer these places. The prince specifically wants to go in to get and possess Susan. 
who is a white woman. <laughs> yes, that is all bad. I will say that there are some descriptions that, and I'm sure C.S. Lewis was blissfully unaware of this, but the way that Prince Rabidash talks about Susan, I thought was actually sort of a very good way of capturing toxic masculinity. <laughs> um, Rabidash is definitely a good depiction of toxic masculinity, but also racist. <laughs> right. It's it's unfortunately also tied into racist notions, but there there are lines, like there's this one line that is just really a perfect encapsulation of how toxic masculinity plays out in their attitudes towards women. So Rabidash is, I think he's talking to his dad at this point, and he says, I shall die if I do not get her. False, proud, black-hearted daughter of a dog that she is. And it's like just a perfect illustration of this notion of I want her, but I hate her. And I hate her because I want her, so I will have her because I hate her. And it's just this kind of weird, circular illogic that happens that I that I really appreciated in a vacuum <laughs> from everything yeah, else. Yeah, I actually think, I think that there is some interesting stuff going on with the Rabidash susan situation. Again, let's just put this as like a, a, a tag for everything. Everything is racist in this book. But <laughs> like, there's an interesting thing of like, so Susan, I guess, so Rabidash visits before the book even begins, he visits the court at Narnia and is courting Susan and is, you know, acting like he's a nice guy. And Susan seems interested. Like, she genuinely seems interested in him. And that's why she and Edmund journey to Tashban is because she actually, you know, thinks maybe this is a potential husband for her. And then they get there and he starts acting, showing who he truly is. And uh, that I thought was interesting. I was like, okay, so we're being told that Susan at, at least is, was not ruling him out on the basis of skin color or ethnicity or race or any of those things. But then, of course, we have a very unfortunate situation that occurs and everyone else is telling her, like, I don't know why you were even considering him in the first place. Like, why were you doing that? So it's this weird situation where, like, there's this potential, but it's it's all, yeah, just devolves into racism. Yeah, it, it, that actually put me in mind of the moment from The Merchant of Venice. There's a moment in that story where one of the characters, I forget their name, so apologies, but one of the characters is being courted by a bunch of different suitors. And there's one particular suitor who I believe is like an African prince or whatever. Yes. Someone from Africa. And he makes his pitch and she's like, all right. And then he leaves the room. And then they just have the most racist diatribe about like, oh my God, like why would I even consider marrying a black person? Like how outrageous, how silly of this person even coming. So like it's this book... And this is why I describe it as insidious, because this book really bounces back and forth from saying the quiet part out loud, which it often does, but also saying things that sort of under the radar to the point that I'm sure that even C.S. Lewis wasn't even aware of the implications that he was making. And I'm, oh, and yeah. I'm sure I'm sure C.S. Lewis is not a huge intentional malicious racist but that doesn't necessarily mean that his stories and his characters and his ideas aren't informed by racially charged ideology and i mean to to talk about like how you can both like have the thing said out loud it also sort of like be lurking underneath i mean so we have the line from edmund where he's like truly sister i should have loved you the less if you had taken him talking to susan about rabbit ash so like he's like straight up saying out loud like you know i don't i don't get it he says it was a wonder to me that you ever could find it in your heart to show him so much favor so we're just told up front that like he's bad even when he was acting good he was bad edmund doesn't really like give a reason so like all you're left to come to the conclusion is, is like it's race <laughs> but then susan's like oh um 
But when he was with us in Narnia, truly this prince bore himself in another fashion than he does now in Tashban. For I take you all to witness what marvelous feats he did in that great tournament. And Hastelude, Hastelude, what? Uh, <laughs> which our brother the High King made for him. And how meekly and courteously he consorted with us the space of seven days. So you're like, okay, so Susan, you know, was, you know, genuinely looking at his personality and his deeds. But then, of course, you remember that Susan is the bad one of the four, right? Like, she's the, the one who's not going to go to Narnia in heaven. She's the one that, you know, is coded as the least virtuous of the four. So, like, the insidious idea that she only had these feelings because she, she's the bad one. So, I think that that scene really sums up a lot of the different currents that are happening in the book. I mean, it's it's complex, and that's part of, like, why it's so hard to untangle and why it is easy to brush it away at times and just be like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Because in the context of this book, yeah, Rabidash is a bad person. And that's fine. Rabidash can be a bad person. And there's nothing wrong inherently with that. But you have all these different undertones that inform your idea of what it means just to be a calamine as a person. And those are necessarily going to reflect back on Rabidash. And when you're being told constantly, this is the way Calormines operate. They are cruel. They enslave people. They force their daughters, I don't know, their 13, 14, 15-year-old daughters to marry 60-year-old men. They mistreat their servants. They mistreat their horses. They steal. They lie. You're just being told constantly that this is just who these people are. And so when you finally get to Rabidash, you are inclined to not to say, oh, Rabidash is a bad person because he, as an individual, is a bad person. But, oh, Rabidash is a bad person because he's a calamine. That's the danger of this book, because it is teaching you that certain races have certain intrinsic values, either good or bad. In this case, the calamines are bad. The Narnians are good. And to put my activist hat on here for a second, as I alluded to earlier, why does it why does it matter? This is a 60 some year old or 70 some year old book by now. Why does it matter? It matters because it is teaching that certain races have certain intrinsic values that make them better or worse than you. We are seeing that people are recognizing, again, that these implicit biases that we hold towards people different than ourselves have consequences. Cops don't kill a white person who uses a forged, allegedly uses a forged $20 bill. People don't jump in their trucks with their shotguns and chase down white joggers. People don't call the police on a white person who asks them to leash their dog. We are seeing the impact of carrying these ideas of what a person is intrinsically, just really based on their background, whether that's their race, their religion, their sex or gender, their nationality, what have you. This entire book is coded with the understanding that Rabidash is a worse person than King Edmund or Prince Corrin or even Shasta himself because he is a brown person, essentially. I, I do think I, I was going to say, and I thank you for um, bringing that all up. I think it's important that we do link it back to today because unfortunately, like, books like this can exacerbate the problems that we already have in our society with those things. And I think that the, the thing that I find most toxic about this book is that it is the idea that not just is the culture bad, not only is the calorie culture just bad, which like people can have bad cultures, you know, but like it's because the idea of blood is harped on quite a bit. So on Page 14 of my edition, when Shasta is first talking to Bree, and Bree brings up running away to the north, 
Shasta says, oh, hooray, then we'll go north. I've been longing to go to the north my all, all my life. And then Bree says, of course you have. That's because of the blood that's in you. I'm sure you're true northern stock. So it's brought up even just that early that because of Shasta's blood, his genetic code, his heritage, whatever, he is different. And this is brought up more times. Let's see. I have another instance written down. Yeah, on page 156, where we're told that uh, Shasta has a true horseman's seat, and that's because there's noble blood in him. So if we're given this idea that Shasta is the way he is because of his blood, then we must assume that everyone else is the way they are because of their blood. And I think that is such, there's a lot of things contributing to racism and racist ideology, but I think at the root of it all is the idea that somehow we are fundamentally different and therefore better or worse, which is obviously fake, 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 fake. Yes, a thousand times yes. That actually brings me to mind because this is something when I was doing my own research on this book, I saw some people arguing like, no, no, no. Actually, C.S. Lewis isn't racist because we get the positive, we get a positive depiction of Calamines with the character of Erebus. Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up because I think there's a big discussion to be had about Erebus. Yes, let's discuss because I oh, disagree wholeheartedly with that. But what are your thoughts? Okay, so I will again put up front here that I'm very colored by nostalgia with this book. I love Erebus as a person. So like, for me, I think that one of the things I like about this book is that with, especially with Shasta, Erebus, and Brie, they're all like very flawed characters. And I've always enjoyed characters that are flawed and don't like, not like the way we get, you know, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where like, <laughs> you know, Lucy and Peter and Susan are perfect. And then Edmund is bad, but then all of a sudden he's good. And now he's perfect. I liked the fact that in this book, we see characters have flaws but also good traits and grow over the course of the story but like you still see that they have flaws at the end so I enjoy Erebus very much as a character that has flaws and also good aspects to her that said you know rereading this I was like because I think she is uh, possibly the sole positive depiction of uh, a calamine in the entire book we could talk a little bit about lass because she's an interesting case and i don't entirely know what to do with her but because she is the sole depiction that is given a uh, positive treatment and, and it goes on to you know marry the hero of our story some of the choices feel bad <laughs> And also the idea, there seems to be this idea put forward that, like, she is somehow the, like, exception that can be redeemed, and she can only do so by following the white people. And, you know, it's not like, I would love to see an Erebus who's like, I'm going to try and change my society, you know, like, that would be great, but that's not what we get. She must go to the white people, and then she can be redeemed from her sins and become a good person, despite the fact that she's calorie. Basically assimilating into what is, in essence, the dominant culture of this book. Basically, her character arc is cultural erasure. The fulfillment of her character is by becoming an Archinlandian? 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 Archilandonite? I don't I really know. I don't know. <laughs> maybe she's Archish because like Finland and then they're Finnish. Oh, well. She's she... Archish maybe? <laughs> this is not important. No, but it is entertaining. We need some levity somewhere. Yeah, that is very, very true. But basically her whole character drive is to escape her native culture because she, it is never explicitly said out loud, but essentially... She cannot operate in her native culture. They will not allow her to operate the way she wants to. It seems solely about the arranged marriage, not necessarily any other element of this culture. So that's kind of unclear. And, it, and if you actually delve into why she has problems with this arranged marriage, 
it seems mostly just because this dude is ugly. We could also, uh, the depiction of him is bad on multiple fronts because he also is a hunchback and and that is brought up as, again, that making him somehow like intrinsically bad. She doesn't seem to protest arranged marriage as an institution. She specifically does not like her arranged marriage. And that's solely why she runs away. So, you know, obviously there are some positive traits about her, but it really strikes me as a bit of tokenism because she is the only one in this book to have those positive traits we don't see courage or honor or loyalty from anyone else in this book who is color me and then even even some other positive traits you you got to be very careful with them because there's early on when she's telling her story and the narrator makes a note that in Calamine society, instead of teaching people how to write essays, they teach people how to tell stories. And this is meant to be a positive thing. You know, the narrator even says that nobody's actually interested in reading essays, which I found, it's like, it's a good kind of self-own on C.S. Lewis's part. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. But we are told this. And it is meant to be a positive thing. But if you kind of dig into that, you're going to see the kind of underlying assumptions of a statement like that, where it is suggested that, you know, it's great that they teach them how to tell stories and they're really good at telling stories, but apparently bad at poetry, that doesn't make sense, but whatever. But apparently they don't teach them academics. They are in essence uneducated from our own perspective of what it means to be educated. And I think there's this, the idea of, um, you know, how even positive stereotypes can be damaging because it... Exoticizes things, yeah. Exoticizes and it pigeonholes people. So we, we are pigeonholing Arvis here into, she's a good storyteller, but everything else, eh, who knows? Right. And I think that, so, yeah, Erebus's arc, other than uh, assimilation, which is very much a part of it, is sort of the lesson she learns is, it's a little bit like a Pride and Prejudice lesson. Yeah. She, as a, a Calamian noble lady, kind of looks down on other people if they don't live up to her standards of what she thinks they should be. So she misjudges Shasta, and she doesn't think about when she's escaping, she doesn't think about the servants and slaves that she's potentially harming by using them to make her escape. And so she has to learn to think about other people and actually like consider them, which is not a bad lesson for anyone to learn. I think that's a good moral, but I, it feels weird in the situation that she's in. And it's interesting because like, so for instance, um, and when they're like making their final push into Archenland, they're being pursued by a lion who's of course Aslan. And he's he's doing this to like help them make up the time to let the Archenlandians know and whatever. But he does uh claw down Erebus's back as they're making their final escape. And later on he tells her he did this because the servant girl who she tricked in order to escape received ten lashes for as punishment. And so Erebus must now, you know, suffer this pain. But I thought it was interesting because another person that Erebus uses in her escape is she forces a servant to, like, forge a letter. Or not a, not a servant, actually a slave in this case. And he really doesn't want to do it. Like, she's very clear about the fact he does not want to do it. And hopefully, uh, the narrative does not tell us, hopefully, like, no one ever finds out and the slave is okay and safe as much as he can be while he's in slavery. But, like, there's no lesson learned about that. I would have thought like maybe the lesson she needed to learn was about like all people. <laughs> I like, I don't know. It's, it's so weird. The lesson that's learned when there's so many other problems going on and she's also just going to completely forget her entire culture and move on to this other culture instead of trying to like maybe help the like color me people. I really just feel like there's some sort of discrepancy there. Yes. I, not to sound like a broken record, but this book is sloppy. Yeah, it's weird because I love some of the character arcs, but they feel misplaced 
in the universe of the story. I would agree. I, throughout this book, like, what is the goal of these individual characters? What are the stakes for the characters outside of just their external circumstances of they're trying to run away and escape slavery? What is at stake for themselves as people? Or, in the horse's case, as horses. And, and I was having such a hard time tracking that, especially Shasta's character. Like, it, it makes sense where Arvis, Arvis, er, I feel like I've pronounced her name three different ways already. Should we just decide on Arvis? Arvis sounds fine to me. Okay. Arvis, her arc, I kind of see where it's coming from and where it's going, even if I am just fundamentally against the implications of what her arc is saying. For the character of Shasta, I have no idea who this person is. <laughs> and for me, it's this its this thing I've noticed with C.S. Lewis, where he has this really bad habit of adding these last-minute addendums that try to build character retroactively. So... One smaller example of that is that there's this point where Shasta's riding into the mountains and he's actually riding through a cloud. And he says, oh, whoa, that's crazy. I shall see what the inside of a cloud is like. I've often wondered. And this is happening maybe 30 pages away from the ending of, of the book. <laughs> We've never been told that Shasta's interested in clouds. We've never been told that this is something he's often wondered before. We've never seen that before. I, you know what? I will defend this one thing. <laughs> this feels safe to defend. I think C.S. Lewis doesn't always build the clearest of characters. So I think we can agree on that. Um, but I will say one of the reasons I like this book is I do feel like Shasta and Erebus and Bree, and even Quinn to some extent are more clear as characters and I think that you get the impression from the beginning that Shasta is a little bit of a dreamer he spends a lot of time fantasizing about the north and obviously uh this is problematic but he spends a lot of time thinking about it and fantasizing about it and that's really what you're told and I think that his actual personality beyond that is kind of unformed which I was like willing to accept because I was like you know, he hasn't really, because of his home life situation, how much has he really, like, fostered? You know what I mean? Like, sure. he's, a, he's a kid. He's still figuring himself out. You're just a kid. Maybe when you're older. And he was figuring himself out in a situation that was, like, he didn't enjoy. And so all he was doing was fantasizing about not being there. And so I think you sort of see him becoming more sure of himself over the course of the book. But I, I buy him wondering about the clouds because I think, like, what did he have in his, his home life that was good? Like, nothing. So you just see him. The only thing you hear about him doing is working and fantasizing. So I think maybe one day he was doing hard manual labor and he was looking at the clouds and he's like, huh, I wonder what the inside of a cloud is like. <laughs> that seems to me like something Shasta would do. All right. I mean, that's fair. I do think that there are bigger points of this idea of, like, why is... Shasta so interested in the North, and the only explanation is that, well, it's his, his northern blood. blood. And we get this arc that, like, Shasta needs to become more brave, and it's like, okay, I I guess. It falls flat for me because it there's never been a question, really, of his bravery at any point. Like, he runs away with a general's horse 20 pages in or whatever into the book. That's probably the bravest thing he did at any point. Well, maybe except telling Aslan to go home. But besides that, it's like, it's not like he's ever really been a coward at any point in the book. So the idea of him, his like fulfillment of his arc being that he's brave. It's like, oh, well, he kind of fulfilled that on page one. This is anticlimactic. <laughs> But that, that actually leads me to the question I would like to discuss. Is it possible to tell this story without being racist? Because one thing I was considering throughout this book is where are the identity crises that these characters should be experiencing? Even though Shasta's background 
is a horrible one where he was basically a slave who was beaten by his quote-unquote father. Nevertheless, he was raised in this society. He was raised with their values. He was raised with their way of understanding the world. There's this big point early on where whenever they mention the Tisrock, they, they say, may he live forever. They say it almost instinctually. And at one point, Bree says the Tisrock, but doesn't say, may he live forever. And Shasta is taken aback. And it's like, why, why didn't you say that? And Bree is like, well, because I believe in freedom and I don't believe in, in these weirdos' ways of slavery and blah, blah, blah. And that's kind of the extent of them grappling with this idea that they are leaving behind their lives, the only lives they've known. And we're never told that, like, Shasta misses the ocean. We're never told that Erevis misses her family <laughs> or, or just the life that she had. And I think a non-racist way of telling the story would incorporate that, where these characters would really actually grapple with this idea of leaving their homes behind, leaving their culture behind, and what it means to go into a different culture and to adopt a different culture and the struggle of, of coming away from something you've known your entire life, of having things that, that you love about that culture, that you really appreciate about that culture, that really inform the way you live and understand and treat other people, and to suddenly be thrust into a completely different world with completely different norms and see that play out. I guess another book, this is a, another book I would recommend, but like, the Kite Runner really tackled this issue of people coming from a Middle Eastern culture and coming out of that. How do they go into this different world and not lose their, their sense of self? Because I think that's a very important thing to note, is that our identity is tied to our culture. Take away our culture and you are taking away our identity. It's not so easy just to say, oh, go move over there and fit in. No, you, no, no one can do that. This story, the whole premise of that is built on identity, and C.S. Lewis just completely misses that. So I think a more positive retelling of this story would really examine that idea of what it means to move away from your own culture into another for whatever reasons those might be, whether you're escaping a, a crisis at home or a crisis in the country, because essentially they are refugees, you know? Mm -hmm. And actually, here's another book I would recommend. <laughs> the Sympathizer is another book that really gets at this question of what it means to be a refugee, leaving your own country, leaving behind what you did and what you understood, and going into, in the Sympathizer's case, going into America and living in America, and having to deal with that. Anyway, roundabout way of saying, I think that that is... It, I mean, it obviously doesn't guarantee that you can't still have a story informed by racist ideology, but I think that would be a much better way of grappling with these issues, of really closely examining what it means to have a certain identity and how that's informed by your own native culture, and how that's impacted when you move away from that native culture. I, I do like that idea, and I feel like it works because I think that uh, you see, like, Bree's whole arc is a little bit of an identity crisis, where he's worried that, like, that he'll get to Narnia, and he won't fit in because he was raised somewhere else. And so he's, like, basically coming home, but he's worried that he will no longer fit in his home. So like he has that whole identity crisis. And I think having the counter of like, I do think that you can read this book and come away with some idea of Shasta's arc as one that's about identity and finding identity. And I don't love the way that's handled. But um, I do think that it would be so easy, because it's already kind of there to, yeah, make more of that sense of, of loss and of transition into both Shasta and Erevis's and even like Brie and Huynh's arcs. I think that'd be super easy to do. I do think like in terms of if they make a, a movie <laughs> or a miniseries adaptation of this. Okay, so, so let's talk about what we know about the series, like about the world of the Chronicles of Narnia from the three books we've read, right? We know that 
the first humans in this world were two white people. Actually, you know what? We don't actually necessarily know that they're white. We know they're British, but they're, they're probably white. They're knowing probably C.S. Lewis. Yeah. We didn't get any comments that they weren't white. So knowing him, I think baseline assumption is that they're white. So we have two white people and their children then uh, interbreed with like dryads and naiads and stuff. And that's where the humans of this world come from. So very confused about how we then get to like color means and Archinlandians and them being totally different like races and cultures very confused about that but like maybe the way to like maybe maybe the Pevensies are the only white people in this world maybe that's the solution we come to (laughs) everyone else is not white like that still doesn't make it great that then they're like the magical savior children but like like I said it's okay to have a bad culture it's okay to have like a bad ruler if we have the nobility in the color mean land be bad that's okay but like what if arch and land was the same race what if you know they were just two nations that had divided at some point arch and land is same same race maybe we see more of the struggles of the everyday color mean people and we're shown that this is a problem with the ruling class still that means that there's going to be bad stereotypes of representation and hopefully we could take some of that out but maybe the way to fix it is to be like it's because this ruling class is bad. And like the everyday people are not like this. You know, there's this whole other nation that's put off that's arch and land that's not like this. I don't know. Do, does that sound? It actually sounds very reasonable to me because okay. it puts me in mind of the Vulcans and the Romulans from Star yeah. Trek. Who... <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, it's a miracle that we've made it this long without me referencing Star Trek. So consider yourself lucky. But in Star Trek, the Vulcans and the Romulans are two alien species that are actually derived from the same ancestor. And they just at some point in their history split off and became very, very different cultures. They basically look exactly like each other, which is why there are so many episodes about, like, Romulan spies impersonating Vulcans, yada, yada, yada. But you have this idea that you take the same culture, split it off, and then sort of see how they grow and how they separate themselves from each other and in what ways. And I, so, yeah, I think I think that's that would be a solution. It's like, don't make it such a stark difference that it's, brown people versus white people and the brown people are bad the white people are good but like if you make them the same race you can avoid a lot of the pitfalls that are present in this book yeah and then it also just like from a narrative perspective makes it make more sense that shasta thought this guy was his dad the whole time which like apparently he did you're not really my dad are you no i'm not I work on Wall Street. And it would also just make, like, I the thing I was weirded out by is I was like, we don't get any, like, other stories of white people being really around color mean. So, like, why is Shasta not, like, why is everyone not, like, why is he here? (laughs) So it would just make more sense if Shasta was, just from a, like, sheerly narrative perspective, it would also be better, is what I'm saying. Not only would it be good for the racism and just make the story, I think, more interesting, It would also make it make more sense. That is actually a very good point. And it would be so much easier to grapple with the culture shock of going from one culture to the other. And because like at the end of this book, yeah, there is kind of it's not it's not really a crisis, but there is something to do with Shasta's identity, because by the end of the book, he is basically re assimilated into the royal family of Archenland. He very quickly refers to the king of Archiland as his dad. He changes his name. Which, there, you know, speaking of microaggressions, Erevis comments about that, oh, Kor is a much nicer name than Shasta. Ah. <laughs> He's so racist. You know, he moves from one identity to the other very easily without, and, and his only conflict with it is that he's just uncomfortable being a prince and there's the there's a whole long scene at the end where he, he's told oh one day he will be king and he's like no 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 i do not want that 
that's basically all that his identity crisis amounts to. Kind of like a reverse Simba. <laughs> so I think your solution would actually give him a chance to really grapple with this idea of, hey, what does it mean to go from, like, these were the values I was raised with as a kid, going to a land where the values are very, very different? There's a lot of opportunities here, a lot of interesting opportunities here. Catch part two next week. For everyone out there, stay healthy, stay safe. We love you, and keep up the good fight. See you next week. Disease, the great increase, grenades, disease, the AIDS, I seize today, like wave, I fade away, I pray today, cause life is crazy. DJ, the score for hard knocks, they wanna crucify with stones and hard rocks.